Okay, welcome to the 42nd episode of an Evolving Man podcast. I'm delighted to be speaking to Sean Chamberlain today. Sean has been involved with the Transition Network since its inception, co-founding Transition Town Kingston and authoring the movement's second book, The Transition Timeline. He is Managing Director of the Fleming Policy Centre and former Chair of the Ecological Land Cooperative and has spoken at venues ranging from Occupy Camps to Parliament. In exploring the cultural narratives charting society's course, he has written for and edited a diverse range of books, magazines, academic journals and other publications, including co-authoring a significant UK all-party parliamentary report with his close friend and regular collaborator David Fleming. His website is darkoptimism.org. So welcome, Sean. Thanks, Piers. It's a joy to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to be speaking to you. I, like we, I was just sharing before we began, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts and one of my guests, sometimes at the end of a podcast, I say, anyone you recommend that I speak to? And Bill Couth, he was like, you have to speak to Sean Chamberlain. So I'm like, okay, how do I get in touch with him? And here's the conversation. So thank you for agreeing to, to speak. Oh, my pleasure. What's on your mind? So how I like to begin the conversation, really, each time is just for you to share a little bit about your path. What's drawn you into the work you now do? Hmm. Well, I suppose uh what about nearly 20 years ago now i was running a learning center for marginalized groups so i was working with um young asylum seekers people with drug misuse issues um people with mental health issues learning difficulties uh, people who the kind of mainstream education system hadn't worked for in one way or another or they hadn't worked for it depending on how you want to look at it and um and I really loved that work. It was it, it felt it felt meaningful and important and, and joyous. Um, but in my spare time, I was learning about at that time, especially uh, the destabilization of our climate and uh, kind of energy resource depletion issues. And it got to the point for me where I started to feel like, well, here I am helping people reintegrate society, but it feels like society itself is charging headlong for a cliff. And um, I want to engage with that somehow. Like I felt called to engage with that somehow. I had no idea how. I didn't really have any any peer group around that sort of area. Um, you know, I'd, I'd talk to friends and I mean, you know, things like climate destabilization were far lower profile then than they are now and um uh, yeah there's a lot of people saying ah you know there's not too much to worry about or at best you know oh maybe you should go and work with with greenpeace or friends of the earth or something and i looked at what they were doing and it, it really didn't didn't speak to me at all um and so what i ended up doing then was uh leaving that job um and i i'd, I'd always i'd never been a kind of money burning hole in my pocket kind of person you know it always been you know I spend what I spend and if I earn more than that I put it away and so I had a bit of savings um and I basically was like if I can live really cheaply um I can probably go a year or so without needing to get another job and that'll give me time to really explore this this stuff that I'm feeling called to um and honestly emotionally that was that was quite a difficult time um you know people would friends would say you know what are you what are you doing you know what are you doing with your life and I didn't really have an answer I just had this sort of sense that I wanted to engage with this stuff somehow but what do you do you know what do you do with huge global issues like this um and so I, I read a lot and I I went to events that seemed interesting and I harassed people who seemed interesting and um and then yeah it was after about a year uh, I heard about this course at a place called Schumacher College down in um, southwest England. And it, I guess 
many of the people who I'd been reading and really kind of vibed with what they were writing were were speaking on this course. It was just a two week course and it was quite expensive to be honest with you. And I had to beg and borrow and scrape to get there. But I had this profound sense that I had to be there. Um, just everywhere I looked in my life, there were signs, you know, it was, it was, it was weird. Um, and I, I did. And, um, I met some other people there who were really, you know, concerned about these issues. The course was called Life After Oil. Uh, this was back in 2006. And um, yeah, I remember one guy who was there saying to me, um, I had the air of a man who'd been wandering in a desert and had found an oasis. <laughs> uh, and it was really like that for me to suddenly have a peer group. Um, you know, we'd sort of sit up till 3 a.m. every night in the common room talking about things and um and we'd always the <laughs> Schumacher College puts on meditation at 6 a.m each morning I think and we'd always say oh yeah yeah we'll definitely be up for that <laughs> and we, we weren't very much um and uh yeah there I I found some allies I guess um I I hooked up with Rob Hopkins who um was had just sort of had the idea for this this transition towns idea which is now this global network um and uh in fact i clearly remember one of um one of the other students on the course ben brangwin was um in a similar place he'd been working in sort of graphic design and um meaninglessly moving pixels around on the screen as he described it and uh and felt a similar urge and so we really clicked and and each time uh you know someone was teaching over the course of the course um we'd sort of be checking them out thinking like well is is this you know something i'd like to get involved with is this something that really inspires me uh and i remember when rob came up and was talking about this idea of transition this idea of kind of local communities recognizing that if we wait for government to act it's going to be too late um and if we act as individuals it's going to be too little but maybe there's this sweet spot in between what we call the human scale very often where you know it's 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 large enough scale that your actions feel meaningful and it's small enough scale that your voice means something um and uh and i remember ben and i sort of nudging each other going oh this is this is interesting what he's saying and 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 ben putting his hand up and saying hey rob um out of interest if you had say three hundred thousand pounds to really develop this idea what would you do with it uh and rob sort of looking back at him and saying why have you got three hundred thousand pounds burning a hole in your pocket <laughs> And then say, well, no, I definitely don't. But I sort of feel like I might be able to raise it for an idea like this. Mm -hmm. um, and they went off into a corner together and started plotting and um, and co-founded the Transition Network together, which has, you know, gone on to have a huge impact on, well, every continent on Earth, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also teaching on that course was this chap, David Fleming, um, who was the only person teaching on the course I'd never heard of before, actually. And uh, and I'd sort of uh, looked him up online before going and um, discovered he had this little booklet called Energy and the Common Purpose, which, so he was the guy who kind of came up with the idea of, of carbon rationing, essentially. Um, and that's what this little booklet was about. And I, I read it before the course and I thought, eh, his heart's in the right place, but this will never work. Um, and so when he was teaching us, I sort of put my hand up and said, well, you know, I have these concerns um and we talked about them a bit in the class but then it was a bit too detailed so he suggested that we had lunch together uh and we did and then at the end of an hour's lunch he said we should have lunch together again tomorrow <laughs> uh so we did and by the end of that second lunch he'd convinced me that he had the answers to my misgivings and i was very excited at the the prospect of this this system for um yeah making a making a meaningful difference and it was something that at the time the uk government were um just about to launch a, a feasibility study into um and this is kind of where this was one of the turning points in my life really where i, I got a bit <laughs> a bit cheeky and um i uh i sort of said to this man in his 60s i guess um you know well i, I read your booklet and it was very inspiring but it left me with these questions and you've got the answers to these questions, but they're not in your booklet. Um, and so other people are gonna have the same questions. Um, also, I think it could be better structured. Um, 
maybe I could work with you to improve it. <laughs> and I, I, I clearly remember this this man sort of looking me down and up. This this impertinent young man who was suggesting I could improve his his life's work. Um, and to my my eternal gratitude, he uh, he proffered his card and and said, "Okay, well, you know, when you're done with this course, we're both based near London, so come look me up." And um, and yeah, he proposed that we work together for a few, for a few months on a second edition and. Um, and then we'd see where that took us. And as it turned out, it took us to working incredibly closely until his his sudden death in 2010. Um, and it was just the most incredible mentor, really. Um, you know, he was the kind of person where I'd read some article by someone or other. I said, David, oh, I read this amazing article by such and such. And he'd say, oh, I'll ring her up. We'll have coffee, you know. Um, and, you know, he'd been working in this area for for decades, although in a very informal and, and institution allergic way um and uh yeah and really i could say that everything i've been doing for the last 15 years or so has has kind of flowed from um the ways that he helped me to unlock to discover how it's possible to kind of uh, live a life based around the things that i that i feel called to engage with um, which, as I say, I didn't really have a clue, but, um, but yeah, the key was just, you know, trusting that impulse, um, and, and following it and, um, and not worrying too much about money, I guess, was the other side of it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Fascinating journey. It's interesting. I just kind of had that, uh, realization that my awakening really happened at the barn in dartington which mm. i think is linked into schumacher college yeah it's the same the same estate and they're very connected yeah yeah i think i went down for a few talks while i was there on retreat at the barn in 2002 and it was around that time that i suddenly was like oh my god boarding school and all of this stuff came up and that began my own journey so fascinating to hear ah, so just a few few years ahead of me you uh you discovered the, the dartington magic yeah yeah and it's only years later i realized that schumacher his son was on the year above me at boarding school oh wow okay. yeah it was like it was only i was reading an old blues an old boy's manual and it was like oh it was his dad and it was like oh my god i don't know him so there we go um so i guess i'd love for you to just share a little bit about this idea david fleming and making a meaningful difference what is that meaningful difference that you first realized in that second lunch meeting with david and yeah how that's maybe changed or developed over the years yeah well at the time you know the topic of those lunchtime conversations was his uh tradable energy quotas system um which, which this uh this parliamentary report that we co-authored several years later is all about um and yeah i suppose at, at the time well certainly up to those conversations i'd always had this sense that well look we're dealing with huge global scale problems we're going to need some kind of huge global scale solutions mm -hmm. um and the line from david's talk that week that really brought me up short was large-scale problems do not require large-scale solutions mm -hmm. they require small-scale solutions within large-scale frameworks mm -hmm. and if there's one line that's that's shaped my last 15 years it, it's that because it really shifted me from thinking okay you know what i need to do to engage with climate change is go and I don't know, get involved with the UN global COP conferences and, and, you know, be part of those negotiations and all that kind of stuff. And that, that line kind of made me realize, well, actually, in a sense, all emissions are local, mm -hmm. you know, they all happen somewhere. Um, and I guess over the years, since I've realized how so many proposed top-down solutions um 
fail to engage with that in a meaningful way. Like if, if you've got some person sitting in a room or some group of people sitting in a room deciding what should happen over millions of square kilometers of land, um, clearly whatever they decide is going to lack the nuance and understanding that the people who live on each individual piece of land could bring to that conversation. And so whatever generalized thing they, they produce and then try and push onto everybody is going to feel profoundly inappropriate in probably most places. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be resented and resisted. And what makes far more sense is to empower those local communities mm -hmm. to figure out what needs to be done. Of course, this really ties in with the transition towns approach. So if a, if a community knows what their skills are, what their resources are, what their absences are, what their longings are, you know, then empower them to do that. And, and one, one process from transition towns is, is this idea of back casting. So, you know, here we are in, uh, say Loch Ray, the local town here in Ireland. And, um, what do we want Loch Ray to look like in 2040? Mm -hmm. And really have a community visioning process around that, a, a held and guided process whereby you come together and you're like, yeah, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is what would really excite me. And then, okay, well, if we're gonna if we're gonna get there in 2040, what do we need to have in place by 2038? And if we're gonna be there by 2038, what do we need to have in place by 2035? And you kind of work your way back until you get to the present day. And then you think, wow, we better get started. <laughs> And um, and that kind of process, that kind of community power, then once you, once the community has decided, okay, this is where we want to go, then they can pull down the resources that they need from some centralized body, perhaps, rather than having it pushed down onto them from the center. Yeah. Um, and that's really the the essence of this kind of um, this text idea. It's basically creating this sense of common purpose in the nation and in, empowering individuals and families and communities to do that so at the time that really excited me well, you know once I talked to David and really got it I was like wow you know if we could see this kind of implemented by a national government mm -hmm. it would make such a difference it would so improve all our futures in a dramatic way with regard to kind of climate change and energy depletion <clears throat> and then you asked me what's changed and mm -hmm. And I guess for me, what's changed is that, so then I kind of threw myself into that, into working on the second edition with David, and then we decided to keep working together. Um, I was invited onto the advisory panel for uh, the department, well, it was then DEFRA, but what's now the Department for Energy and Climate Change, or it's actually it's changed again, but the relevant government department, and um, worked with them through this, this feasibility study into the system. And you know long story short lots of lots of technical discussions about fine details of the system and everything else um but long story short what happened is that the the uk treasury at the point where these you know these these various reports that made up the feasibility study had concluded that the system was um progressive in the sense that it would benefit poorer families in the country that there were no technical obstacles to implementing it um, that it was more popular with people than the alternatives. Um, but then essentially the Treasury stepped in and said, yeah, but this is, as I would put it, calling our bluff. Um, because politically we've realised what people want to hear. And what people want to hear is that we're leading the world in dealing with climate change uh, and also not asked to do anything to change their lifestyles with regard to climate change. Um, and from a politician's point of view, I think they've done an outstanding job of, of delivering on that. Um, of course, the problem with that is it doesn't do anything to address the actual physical, literally physics related issue of um, you know, shifting concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the destabilization of our weather systems and everything else. Um, and so we have a government, certainly in the UK, and I think in most of the... Uh, the minority world um which is paying great lip service to climate change to you know the paris climate accords etc cetera, etc cetera. um and as greta thunberg has so brilliantly um encapsulated 
yet having absolutely no intention of changing the things that fundamentally would need to be changed to achieve the targets that they claim they've signed up to in a legally binding way. Um, and so Tex would, would, would call that bluff. It would say all that Tex does is implement your emissions targets, UK government. That's all it does. It, it guarantees that we actually achieve the legally binding targets that you've set. Mm -hmm. But actually, they have no intention of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and in practice, like there's an awful lot of talk, uh, uh, people who engage with this stuff, there's a lot of talk of this concept of decoupling, which is the notion mm -hmm. of uh, altering the relationship between economic growth and emissions. So generally, as economies grow, they emit more, which doesn't yeah. sound very surprising. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, a kind of holy grail in this kind of world would be, well, can we continue growing but emit less? And that's called decoupling, like take decoupling growth from emissions. Um, and again, there's a whole academic discipline around this, but I looked at it long and hard enough to feel confident to say that the answer is no, we can't do that. Not in an absolute sense. We can we can improve it. We can grow with fewer emissions increasing, like lower increases in emissions, but absolute decoupling, no. Uh, consequently, if we actually actually achieve the kinds of emissions reductions that we've notionally committed to mm -hmm. that would mean the end of economic growth and the end of economic growth would mean under our current economic system um economic collapse um because for various reasons we have an economic system that relies on on growth year on year mm -hmm. so i didn't know all of that at the time but what i did know was that the Treasury came along and stomped on this idea um, for reasons that, if you knew what you were talking about, didn't make the slightest bit of sense. Um, and so I looked into why that was, and I came to understand a lot of the things that I've just said. And at that point, I thought, OK, I don't feel like policy advocacy is where I need to be anymore, because I'm still convinced that this is the policy that we need um the more i look at it the more i'm convinced of that uh i'm also convinced that there's no way to get it implemented within our current po politics um and so that that was quite a it's quite a heavy realization um because i know how desperately we need enlightened policy um and so then i thought well what now um you know i don't want to just sink into cynicism or depression and uh you know there's no hope and we're all doomed and you know that doesn't feel like who i want to be it doesn't feel like the story i want to tell with my days but i also don't want to lie to myself and say well this just must work so i'm going to keep banging my head against the wall even though i know deep down that i'm not going to succeed um and so if i rule out those possibilities what's left <laughs> yeah. um and uh, and so again, I think, you know, I'm someone who naturally, again, this is only really with hindsight, but that that year of um, seeking that led me to, to to kind of David and Tex, um, I think I have I have phases like that, and then I find something that really excites me and inspires me, and that I really want to throw myself into, and I throw myself into that for as long as it takes for it to either reach fruition or conclusion or, or for me to realize that it's no longer feeling the inspiring thing to engage with um and so then I, I moved back into this this kind of more reflective space and that was really around the same time um my david fleming died very suddenly um at the end of 2010 uh, just just as we were preparing for the launch of this parliamentary report uh and then three weeks later my fiance died equally suddenly and unexpectedly um and so on that level as well um you know my my kind of story of how society might shift and adapt into a, a better future kind of ceased making sense to me ceased being plausible to me and on a personal level my my, my personal story of the path my life was going to take and this you know my my romantic partner and my kind of work partner um both weren't there anymore uh and so i i 
went into very naturally this period of kind of grieving and um you know what i sometimes call the the space between stories mm -hmm. um you know when the story that's motivated you and helped you make sense of life falls apart and you don't have a replacement i mean you can grab one if you if you if you if it's too scary to be in that space between stories you can just say oh well i'll just work even harder at getting this implemented but i i didn't believe in that um and i guess two things happened there um one uh one was that a friend of mine said that the best way you can honor people you love after they die is to keep alive what was best in them in the world through your own life and at that time pretty much all that really mattered to me was honoring david and maria and and all that they had been in in my life and in life in general um and so in various ways i i kind of gradually as i had any energy for anything started looking into that um and in maria's case with her family we were able to set up a an orphanage in in pakistan where she was from and and that's mm. a real appropriate legacy for her in various ways and um and with david it was very clear that he'd been his whole life working on this book well for about 30 years working on this book um the dictionary for the future and how to survive it which was this huge tome um <laughs> which he never let me look at well well we where we were working together actually just in the last couple of months of his life although we didn't know it was the last couple of months of his life he first said there were a couple of entries that i had particular expertise in that he'd like to tentatively get my input on um but he said he was he was wary because it was so close to his heart and and we were such good friends that if um if i didn't like it he knew we'd fall out <laughs> and he didn't want us to fall out so um after his death i found the manuscript and um was able to read it and was absolutely blown away by this work and so it became very clear to me that um bringing it to publication was not only the most appropriate way of of honoring my great friend and a book that i felt a deep hunger for in the world but also it felt very appropriate to that kind of wall i'd hit in terms of policy engagement because i thought well i need to step back and work more um i don't know in a less solid maybe more abstract way with some of the kind of uh, the deeper cultural stories mm -hmm. the, the deeper narratives of our culture because as they change our politics changes and as our politics changes other other policy interventions become possible so it became clear to me that without change at that level uh, that didn't feel any point to me to trying to get radical policy implemented and um and yeah david's book it was certainly one of the levels of it is, is is very much about that it's about you know what's what's important in life what what's what's meaningful and as as one reviewer put it it's less about what we stand to lose in the face of kind of economic and ecological and cultural crisis far more about what we've lost already um and stand to regain if we do things right and um and so yeah that came to feel very much like my work um in in the aftermath of of those bereavements and of the um failure to see texts uh implemented as a system um and also because it felt true and real in those ways um it was a really healing process for me um it was really a something that i cared about and believed in and, and could throw myself into um and initially for the first year or so of that work i didn't have you know a publishing deal or anything i just knew this work needs to be done and i'm going to do it and and to my surprise david left me ten thousand pounds in his will which um i'd learned to live cheaply so that would keep me going for a couple of years and so i was like okay like not going to worry about it just going to work on this task that's in front of me that feels absolutely the right thing to do and and see where it leads mm, thank you what a fascinating story it's and as you're speaking i can see 
lots of tributaries going off in different directions. So now it's the choosing. You know, I, I often say to my friends, the, the mark of a good conversation is the number of fascinating tangents you never got to explore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've got a few. I've, I've underlined a few so far. I think my the, the first one I underlined was this idea of the grieving process. We spoke about this a little bit before, and I guess this is partly my work, as I mentioned at the, you know, in the pre-conversation, is the grieving process and leadership, and I and and I guess that's partly, I guess from some of my other discussions with people, is this idea that um, something like a boarding school education, which a lot of our leaders have been to, it's like this rupture. So there's separation and it's a grieving, but we're not allowed to grieve. And I kind of you mean the rupture from from your parents, from your family, from your parents and your yeah. home life. Yeah. And as you're saying that, it's like, oh, I wonder. And it's just a, a question for myself. And I don't know if it's true. Wonder if many of our leaders are carrying grief. And like you said, they don't have this space between stories. They've just been pushed from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. And almost this grief is driving this system on one level and we just need time to pause. They need time to pause. And I don't know how that looks. Um, but as you say that, I just had that space because that's what happened for me after the balm. I spent three years in a Buddhist monastery. Right. One of the monks who was coming to visit, uh, it was an ex-monk teaching at the balm. Uh, he said, oh, why didn't you? I said, I really could do with some help. So I had a few counseling sessions with him. And then mm -hmm. he directed me to the monastery he used to live in. And I went there for 10 days and spent three and a half years. <laughs> falling, <laughs> falling totally apart. I mean, right. very historically, you know, tried to commit suicide and self-harming and those things. But I just cried and I cried and I cried. And then I came out the other side. And what you mentioned about the grieving process, the space between stories, that was my space between stories. Right. Because you didn't have a picture of any far side. It wasn't like, oh, I'll go into this and then maybe eventually I'll reach this far shore. It was just no, yeah. space between stories. Yeah. yeah. And, and I almost feel I can kind of see that with our leaders is going on one direction and they're not... It's almost like because their grief in my feeling is it's there's a lot there yeah. their decisions of what they're doing you know and again i'm maybe opening up more tributaries but this idea of the native americans or the first nations talking about we make decisions for the next seven generations rather than in my work in the city pre-breakdown was we make decisions for the next three months for the next shareholders um dividend and mm -hmm. I see that's what our politics and our systems kind of about. It's not far sighted. So, yeah, I've realized I've opened up a few avenues, but this idea of grieving oh. and also leadership. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I'm put in mind of a, a line I read recently, which. I won't quote accurately and I don't remember the source of which is most unlike me, but um, that trauma at the individual level can look like personality mm -hmm. and trauma at the family level can look like kind of family traits. Mm -hmm. Trauma at the cultural level can look like colonialism. It can look like genocide. It can look like, mm -hmm. um, and Well, I don't know much about your background, but certainly I was born into, you know, the English culture and, you know, in many ways, the, the, the globally dominant, globalized culture of, you know, Westernism or whatever. And um, it's killing everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's literally killing hundreds of species a day um, now. It's killing our future generations of humans it's killing present generations of humans 
uh, it's poisoning the world. Um, it's destabilizing the climate. I mean, I remember I wrote a piece a few years ago that, you know, I think when I talk to elders, they tell me that 50 years ago, everyone just quietly assumed that the next generation would be better off than us. Mm-hmm. You know, that was just sort of, nobody really talked about it that much, but you just sort of generally assumed that was the case. And I think today, nobody talks about it all that much, but everyone just, just quietly assumes that the next generation will be completely screwed. Mm-hmm. Um, and what changed there? You know, <laughs> like what, 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 what brought about that deep shift? Because that is not the mark of a culture that's making good decisions um you know it used to be I'll, I'll sacrifice and sacrifice to to leave my kids a better life than what i had now the dominant ethos seems to be ah what do i care i'll be dead by then mm-hmm. um i mean this is this is epochal cultural shift and it it doesn't seem to be even named let alone addressed very much um and uh, you know you know far more than i do about um the realities and the cultural impact of boarding school but um it's it's very clear to me that our so-called nominal leaders um can't be very much in touch with all parts of themselves if they're able to act in the ways that they're acting mm. um and so i feel pretty confident that there is fear there at facing certain realities and you and I both know that that space between stories is very many things but one of the things it most certainly is is terrifying mm. um and you know, one analogy that I sometimes use is in, in the same way that if you break a limb for example um often you don't you don't feel the pain of it initially the physical pain is is sort of too much to feel and so you only sort of feel it later as it's and i and i think we do something very similar with emotional pain as as certainly human beings and probably all animals that um you know in the face of overwhelming grief we just go numb you know we we shut down we don't really feel anything anymore and that's appropriate you know when when it's just too much to deal with um it's too much to deal with and so we don't deal with it um but there's a there's a really important distinction between loss and grief you know loss is the event grief for me is the process of healing from the event yeah um and i sometimes describe grieving as being like an ongoing process for me both with regard to the the grief for my you know my individual personal bereavements but also my grief for what's unfolding in our culture and, and on our planet um you know if grief is a kind of shutting down and numbing then that's appropriate but it it, it steals our aliveness mm-hmm. it steals our joy it steals our mm-hmm. excitement our wildness and Grieving is the process of, for me of going back to each of those doors that I slammed shut against the pain mm-hmm. and opening them. Mm-hmm. And, and that's incredibly painful because behind each of those doors is, is, is this wall of pain. That's why I slammed it shut in the first place. But also behind each one of those doors is part of me, you know, part of, part of my aliveness, part of my joy, my spirit, my reality. And so it's this sort of, I talk with my best friend sometimes about the difference between sort of clean pain and dirty pain, like so, somehow going back into that pain and, and, and facing it is it's painful, but, but I know it's right. Like it, it's clean and it's good and it's a, a healthy needed process. Um, dirty pain might be something like when you've done something awful mm-hmm. and you know, you've done something awful and the feeling you have when you lie to cover that up mm-hmm. And it hurts, but God, it feels wrong. Like everything about it makes you feel twisted up and dirty and wrong. And again, that distinction is so important. Like it's not sort of 
pain bad like some pain is is appropriate i mean if you talk to people who are born without the ability to feel pain you know it sounds like a superpower but it's a nightmare you know they they cut themselves and they don't know you know they could stand there with their hand in a flame and you know it, it would burn um you know pain is pain is a friend ultimately um but if our relationship with it becomes too full of fear then it becomes problematic and so yes i can well see that there must be elements of our leaders that they're not not facing and i imagine the reason for not facing that is is fear um and um i was actually just just yesterday um reading a book that contained this really interesting line about what therapy would look like if it weren't focused on healing wounds and trauma but instead focused on engendering cultural revolutionaries mm. because our culture damn well needs them you know it needs people who are sick of this crap and determined to turn it into something inspiring and life affirming and joyous and and future preserving um and uh you know i'm put in mind actually of a and a sort of intervention that really helped me which was a um a retreat with a group called eco dharma um who uh which was i think was founded by this guy g who um he talked to me about how you know he sort of grew up around a lot of um sort of spiritual hippie communities um where a lot of people just sort of travel around the world from meditation retreat to meditation retreat doing all this inner work and it always felt to him a bit sort of hollow ultimately and that it, it becomes just sort of navel gazing for the sake of navel gazing and, and do you never actually feel like you want to apply any of this mm -hmm. supposed spiritual insight to the world like go out and do something with it um and then as he became an adult he went out and um became a bit of an activist and had a lot of activist friends and he'd often see people really burning themselves out um in you know trying to change the culture or or, or improve things or create alternatives or resist things um and so he created this kind of eco dharma place and and project um as a way of trying to bring to each of those what's missing you know like if, if you're if you're just driven to save the world or, or resist the evil or whatever it is it can be completely exhausting especially when um the world's suffering can can be a bit of a bottomless pit um if you don't have that grounding in joy actually and or, or or spiritual grounding or you know like that that grounding that this is this is who i want to be yeah. um and conversely if you if you spend your whole time reflecting on you know the the kind of spiritual grounding and the joy but never actually never actually apply your spirituality then you you end up in a it's a bit like the people who go to church every sunday to ask forgiveness for the things they did monday to saturday and then do them again monday to saturday you know and you think well that's, that's something there's something lacking there mm -hmm. um and so yeah I, th I think there's there's this deep wound in our culture i mean i'm sure boarding schools aren't the only uh root of it but they're certainly uh, part of it as i hear from the likes of yourself um and and for me the question is yeah how do we in our work engender more cultural revolutionaries how do we bring more people to the work of not just healing our personal wounds but healing our, our cultural level wounds and um and those two go hand in hand um you know just yeah just just focusing on our personal wounds can become this sort of never-ending process mm -hmm. of of gazing ever deeper and deeper into the abyss and there comes a point for me at least where um you know i i sit in meditation and then something challenges me and says okay right well if that's what you believe go and do something about it and then if i get too 
caught up in the doing something about it something inside me says well hang on you know <laughs> there's there's actually two quotes that maybe encapsulate I hadn't really thought of this before but that maybe encapsulate the two things i try and hold in balance here and one is from edward abbey who said sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul mm. and you know that i hold very dear on the other hand i can't remember who said um action for action's sake is the last refuge of the morally bankrupt mm. you know, it's very easy to hide from facing stuff in just doing all the time mm. it's very hard to, it's very easy to hide in just reflecting all the time and never get to doing um and yeah that that dance between the two i think is one of one of the key arts that our culture doesn't teach us <laughs> yeah thank you